so hello, good morning. Um, before I begin, let me just give a deep thanks to the committee that allowed me to be here today and that believed in my little hobby from a person who, uh, who is basically dealing with this type of technology just for the last two years. Uh, but I do hope that you enjoy it nonetheless. My presentation today will be about um, something that would probably make me rich if, um, if it works fantastically well, and it does somewhat, but not to the degree that I, well, you'll see. Uh, but basically, the summary here is I am going to show you a solution which uses in-memory technologies such as Ignite and Spark and build on that to have a solution that can predict the market share value from different companies and can aid investors in their decisions. So let's start off with the absolute basic. What is the stock market? Basically, companies, when they want when they want capital that they don't have so that they can grow, they go public. And what that means is that there is a bunch of uh, investors that are private at first, like from firms, and they buy shares from that company and that gives them the money that they need to grow. On a secondary phase, those uh, firm investors will then sell the shares to individual investors. And that's where the magic begins. That's when the, pri the individual investors will buy and sell stocks between themselves. And the value of these stocks depends not only on the value of the company itself, it depends on factors like the, the economy from the country or natural disasters. So there's a variety of factors that go into account for the value of equities. Now, I've, I've been talking about the word investor, but that's not actually the word that I should be using. Because there are two main kinds of market players. Ones are the investors, and ones are the market traders. The investors are those that hold stocks for a long time. When they invest, they want to be a part of the company that they invest in. They hold the stocks for years. And the idea here, uh, in terms of returns, is I'm going to invest in these select few companies, and nine out of 10 will fail me but one of them will be so successful that I will get my returns back plus, uh, or I will get what I invested plus some more returns from all those 10 companies. Um, however, you can see here that the profit, uh, the rate at which you make some profits is very slow because basically you only see returns after a few years, maybe more. But then we have the other type of market players, which are the traders, and that's where we're going to focus on. Market traders are those that only keep shares that they buy for a few hours, a few minutes, or even a few seconds. But they never keep stocks, or very rarely they keep stocks from day to day. It's called day trading. And essentially the logic here is they buy the stocks when they are cheap and because they know or they have uh, the information or they've read the news and they think that the, the price is going to go up, then they buy it right now so that in the, in the next hour or the next five minutes, they can sell it and they, and they make some, some profit out of it. And, you can clear, and um, a subset of these market traders are what's called the, the scalpers. 
And those are the subsets of the traders where in memory comes very in handy because these are the ones that keep data only for a few minutes or even a few seconds. The idea behind this is you're not going to make a lot of profit because basically if you, if you buy an equity in one minute and you sell it in the next, the difference between the price is maybe a few cents at max one dollar or something. So the return is never going to be that big. So when you invest like this, the initial investment needs to be very large on the order of $25,000 minimum. Um, and the idea is the more you invest, the more stocks you buy, the greater the profit will be. But it also has that risk factor of you have to get it right. Because if you don't, your wins will very quickly balance your losses because it's only a few cents. And uh, as such, you require a way uh, in which you can uh, make those trades and you have to accurately know or have a tool that allows you to know if the price is going to go up or, or down and if you should buy or sell. Um, essentially, this is an example from the Alibaba group. Um, what I said about the, the stock prices varying little is very true. Um, but you can see that in the first hour of the market, which is when um, people want to invest the most, and it makes sense, um, it's the most volatile time to invest, to, to make trades, sorry. Um, and the reason is, you can see that the volatility the volatility is so huge that the prices actually vary a lot more than in the rest of the day. But it's only one hour. It's only on that time frame. And so, in order to take advantage of this volatility, we need a solution that allows us to query the data, to collect the data immediately in that in uh, one minute minimum, and it has to collect the data, it has to process the data, it, is, it needs to store it, and the database should be um, something that allows you to query it really fast and then display it in a graphical manner so that the market traders who don't necessarily know a lot about Spark and Ignite and etc. actually know where they should put their money on. Um, and essentially, that is why we need a memory-driven architecture. We need to collect data from multiple, from multiple companies, multiple equity types, so that we know which ones we need to, to invest on. And we need to invest a lot, as I've said before, because the return, because only then will we have enough returns to make a living out of doing this. Um, and the other thing is, uh, indeed, um, we need an architecture that can scale because more and more companies go public and as they go public, the data size increases and as such, the solution needs to be highly scalable. So what I'm going to propose I don't know if um, Abe is here, but he would probably kill me if he saw this slide due to the presentation that he did before. Um, this is basically a, uh, uh, it has Hadoop is what I want to say. Uh, and, um, but the idea here, and I know that this may seem sort of confusing, but the rest of the presentation is basically we're gonna go through the different sections that are outlined here um, so that you can un understand the architecture in detail. So first, we look at the data source for the, the architecture. And right now, the data source that I'm using to collect the equities is called Alpha Vintage, which is a 
leading provider of uh, data for stocks and currencies and uh, cryptocurrencies. And this um, allows us to do um, API calls to the, to the Alpha Vantage server and we collect the data in the format that you see there. It's JSON format. Um, and uh, indeed, we, we get data with minute to minute latency, uh, w which is very, very good. Uh, and it's also completely free. Uh, the, the downside of this is that this is the, uh, the point of failure in the architecture because I'm not in, in control of the source. And usually in your businesses, you will usually be in control of your data sources, but in this case, if the server goes down for any reason, that's, the architecture basically becomes useless. And there's nothing that we can do to solve that. Um, and the other thing is, there is a minimum of API calls that you can do. It's around three per second, okay? So, this is our data source. Regarding data ingestion, so basically, how do we get the data from the server? And here I'm, I wanted to talk to you about two frameworks that are very related, but are somewhat different. One is Kafka, which I, I believe that you know somewhat. It's a distributed platform that allows you to collect long flows of data to something called a Kafka topic. And um, basically, we have a producer or multiple that consume from multiple sources. In this case, it would be the API calls. We have multiple producers. They do multiple API calls to the, the Alpha Vantage server. They put the data into the Kafka topic in raw format, and then the data will be consumed so that it can be processed, and, and that will come further ahead. Um, Revit also has the concept of producers and consumers, but it's, uh, but it, it's more a message broker. So basically, while in Kafka data can live for a long time, and it is meant to be there for a long time, Revit works more like a messaging system. It's messages are short-lived, and the idea behind it is uh, these messages will coordinate tasks. If you use, for example, Airflow or Celery, uh, if you go down to the internals, they use Revit so you can schedule the execution of tasks. And so, why am I presenting you this? Well, data ingestion needs to have two fundamental things. One is load balancing, and the other one is fault tolerance. Uh, and the idea here is very simple. For load balancing, we have three different servers, which can be either separate virtual machines or containers in, in the same server. And the idea here is that uh, the load balancing is done because uh, we divide the load by one third. So basically the API calls are divided. There's nothing to it. Um, but the fault tolerance is when um, Revit comes in in handy. So what happens is we have a Revit queue and minute to minute that Revit queue is filled up with equity symbols. The producers all go to that queue and they make the API calls to Alpha Vantage based on the value that they got from that queue. So what happens is if one of the producer fails? Well, since the other two are connected to the same queue, there will be no data loss. There will be some late, some latency, some more latency to the operation, uh, but it won't result in data loss if you lose one of the producers, or even two, because they're connected to, to the same source, and thus the API calls will continue. This is the way that we achieve load balancing and fault tolerance. 
Moving on to data processing, we have Apache Spark. Apache Spark is a distributed processing framework. What that essentially means is that we can parallelize tasks between different machines. Um, and the idea is if you have a lot of data that doesn't fit uh, in the memory, oh, by the way, this is in memory. This is where it begins. Um, so basically the processing is all done in memory, but in different machines. The idea is if you have a lot of data, it won't ne necessarily fit in the memory of a single computer, and thus you need to distribute it, uh, to distribute it in parallel. Spark, um, the abstraction that Spark offers is the RDD, which is the Resilient Distributed Data Set. Uh, which is divided into partitions, and these are the ones that are processed by different machines. S Spark has four different modules, and the one that we're going to focus more today on, or in, in the processing part, is Spark Streaming. This basically, basically Spark began as a batch processing tool. So you basically would start the application of Spark, it would fetch the data from disk or some other place, and it would do the processing in memory and load it to disk again. Um, in the recent years, which are not that recent right now, but basically some time ago, they decided that they wanted to tackle the near real time field. And as such, they developed this module which basically works like Spark, the original core, except it does micro-batching. So you basically can tell the application of Spark, um, you will run for five minutes, and you have five minutes to collect the data, to process it, and send it wherever you want to send it. You have those five minutes. Um, and uh, this allows us to do processing in near real time. Um, in this um, work, the um, microprocessing micro batch time is of one minute. And basically, uh, this is the, the, um, the idea. We basically have a data that comes from Kafka in the form of a stream. And inside the stream, we have RDDs, which are mapped uh, sequentially, and then they finally load the data once the data is f fully transformed. And I think on the next slide you can see exactly the flow that it takes. Uh, when the data is transformed into a format that is accepted by the storage, then the process ends and it repeats again. Um, the um, it's no surprise, I, I believe, that, these, that the storage for this data will be an Ignite cache. But I haven't gotten to Ignite yet, so basically what I want you to see here is this is the, form, the format that we get once the processing is done. So basically it's a table, it's like a SQL table, uh, and you basically get the, the information of the open prices, the closed prices, volumes, uh, the record date, um, and essentially the way that we do this is we use that um, the equity data class to do the mappings between the JSON and uh, a Java object. But I want to talk to you, ah, uh, sorry. Um, Something that I also wanted to showcase, I don't know if you can see it from there, but basically this is from the Spark UI. Um, and interestingly, the time that, that it took to process around 100 or 200 equities was around two seconds. So it fits within the one minute that we have to do the processing, since the data comes in minute to minute batches. So that's not too bad. Apache Ignite, I've used it as a in-memory uh, database, but Ignite is much more than that. Um, 
Ignite is, a, a, is very hard to define because of that, because it's an in-memory database, but it also does computations. Um, earlier this year, it got a machine learning model. Um, so it's very hard to define, but it is a platform. It, it's a, a data grid in which you can uh, do processing and storage of data in memory. It has some very cool stuff like the concept of self-discovery from different nodes, which is really interesting. Um, it's, very, it's extremely easy to scale because of that. Um, and the idea here is there is a, the, basic, um, the basic element of Ignite on the storage part is the cache, which is essentially the same as, as a table. And basically that cache can be partitioned between different nodes. You can make backups so it becomes resilient, which is something um, that it wasn't before. You don't have to persist to disk be, because the data will be distributed between nodes and if one node fails, uh, all is well. And it also uh, allows us to do SQL queries at ease uh, because it, it is compliant with SQL. Um, I basically used, I discovered the Ignite framework because I discovered the integration that it had with Spark. And essentially what happens here is that an RDD from Spark has direct mapping with an Ignite cache. And um, so basically, this has some implications. Um, in, in Spark, when you do a mapping between one, R, one RDD and you convert it into another, there's this concept of lineage and immutability, which means that an RDD cannot be changed. However, if you map an RDD to a cache, you can then, you are able to change the cache, like delete records or update records. And that will allow you to have two things. One is RDD mutability inside the same Spark app, the same Spark job. And you can also share the same RDD between Spark jobs, which wasn't possible before. An RDD is an element from one Spark job and one Spark job only. Um, and that is um, something that I've used to persist the data, even though I didn't need to, that is what I used to persist the data and then clean the cache. Uh, but basically, just to show you, this is the way that you start the Ignite context. You can specify uh, how many backups you want, what is the, the way that you want to do the mapping. Uh, as a caveat, this is from uh, the 2.2 version from, Ignite, and in version 2.4, they introduced the data frame uh, API, I believe, which means that I, uh, that the mapping that I did to a Java class, I could have avoided, uh, but this needs some updating. Uh, and so basically what you do is, you construct an RDD with a key value pair, and then you send the data to an Ignite cache, which is a key value is a key value store, but with, with SQL capabilities, which is really cool. Um, for those of you who use commodity hardware, um, if you want to keep data from um, like one month before, you really uh, need to find ways to also persist the data. Ignite has a native persistency to it, but I find that HDFS has a directory org organization that I like, and uh, Spark very easily sends data to HDFS. Uh, and as such, what I do is every day, or every week in, in this case, I get data from the Ignite cache, I send it to HDFS, to one directory, 
and then I clean all the records from that week, and thus I release memory. Finally, we have the equity classification. Um, and this, and here basically is where um, we want to look at the data and we, we want to predict how the data will behave or how the prices are going to evolve. The idea here for the architecture that I'm presenting is um, in one minute, we want to predict the value of that share for the, next, for the five minutes ahead. And in that time frame, you have the time to see if you want to, to buy or sell the stock based on the predictions that this yields. Um, this is Spark TS. It's a package developed by Cloudera. Um, and it basically takes a, a um, RDD and it converts it into a vector RDD, which is called the time series RDD. And what you have is basically each of the, the keys from, or each of the elements of the RDD is a vector with a different equity, which allows you to parallelize between different machines very easily. And the idea is you have the time series RDD, you take out the null values, which in this case I use the nearest neighbor approach, which is very basic, but data science is not my forte. But the idea here is that you apply an algorithm in a parallelized way, uh, and you get, a, you get the predictions for the time frame that you specified. The algorithm that I used was ARIMA, um, which relies on three parameters. It's the P, D, Q parameter. Um, the first thing we have to do with the ARIMA model is we need to differentiate. Basically, we want our model, our ARIMA model, to have as little tendency as possible. The trends sh shouldn't be there. And as such, by, the, by differentiating by one degree, the goal here basically in these graphs, which are the autocorrelation functions, is that uh, the quicker it goes to zero, the better. And by trial and error, uh, I found that differentiating it by just one degree yield the best results. And you can also see that by the standard deviation, which reduces immensely, and that is desirable for our model. Um, then, to select P and Q, um, it's mostly by trial and error, but there are some rules that you can follow. The idea here is that if the autocorrelation function shows a positive value upwards in uh, relative to the first lag that you see, then you should adjust your P parameter, the autoregressive parameter. Um, and as such, that's what I did. And I built an ARIMA model with a one, one, zero parameters. This is basically how I do the the classification, like I told you, it's basically the, the RDD with the original data. It goes through, a, through some processing to convert it to a time series RDD. Then finally, uh, we use the ARIMA to predict the values for the next five minutes. And then we update it to a separate Ignite cache which is the, equi the, um, the equity results, and so basically, or the equity status. Um, and here we see the predicted value, but also the status, which is do not invest, or uh, buy, sell, um, whatever you want to register for the end user to see. This is what we got uh, from the, the visualization, so I use Tableau um, to, to uh, plot the graphs. Basically, 
Ignite has an um, in integration with Tableau and we are able to query it so quickly that as soon as data comes to the Ignite cache, we can see the results here in, in these graphs. So this is for the 22nd of, of June, so last Friday, and it's for Facebook stock. You can see there that indeed in the first hour, the prices differ quite a lot from the rest of the day, which indicates that variance that, or, or that volatility that I was talking about before. Uh, this is from, I believe, Amazon also. So you, you can see that in this case, in, in this first case, it remains relatively constant, but uh, you should buy stock or sell stock depending on the trends. The idea, the idea with this is also, this basically showcases the, vo the volume for different equities. And an interesting thing that you can see here is that you, you, you have the bigger companies like Facebook and and Amazon, and the share volume there is very noticeable. But then you have those companies there that have very little volume of shares sold, and that you wouldn't necessarily know, and thus would necessarily buy their stocks, because you, you don't even know that they exist. Uh, but because we're only talking of a few cents of, of a difference, like I said, you, when you trade stocks, in this way, doing scalping, you get very low returns per share, be it Facebook or some other company that you don't know. So in essence, if you invest, for example, this is the data for a company called um, Mor Morph Systems, I believe, uh, which is a company with um, bio, biochemical products, I believe. And the idea here is you, you see that, like Facebook, there are oscillations. And it's only of a few cents or one dollar in exactly the same way. Sure that the prices are going to be lower, but the returns that you make are the same or pretty much the same that you would do by buying and selling stocks from Facebook or Amazon. And this is also from another company here from the, the United Kingdom. It is a company that does synthetic materials. So basically this architecture allows you to discover because it it goes and fetches all of the equities that you can think of. It allows you to see stocks that you wouldn't know before. The idea in the end is to have something like this. You have the stocks from Am Amazon and you have the end. This is from 9.30 and that's midday. And uh, below you have the trading the status for the trade. And uh, it tells you whether you should buy or sell the stock in that, in that specific minute. What I, uh, what I outlined there was an instance where the prediction was wrong. But if you, if you look at this attentively, you will see that, e that when, uh, when it gives us a wrong prediction, the value of the error is still inferior to what we invest to to the earnings that we did before. So basically, the failure compensates the wins a little bit, or the the wins compensate the misses. Um, and um, I actually, since I believe in Murphy's law. Um, and um, I wanted to show you how the architecture works, and also because most of the uh, most of the most of the equities that I have are from the 
NASCAV um, sorry, are from the um, NASCAV index, which is from America. It's currently 11.30, I believe, which means that the stock market is not open yet, so I can't really show you the stocks evolving in uh, real time right now. So what I did was I did this little film, which I, which I don't think it's running, but um, I came prepared for that. So here you can see that the equity will update there. And then we start a timer. Here we have um, the Amazon equity price. And you could see that here, in this moment, the equity updated. So I'm going to turn on the chronometer. And you have to believe that I'm not, that I'm not cheating. So I'm going to fast forward the video and it's basically running. And what I want to show you is when a minute goes by, you can see that the equity, that the value is going to be updated. There you go. Also, the trading status will be updated for the next five minutes. So whether you should sell or buy the stock. Um, and essentially, the next part is I want to show you the I want to show you the the processing part. So basically, this thing here is the equities being consumed from Alpha Vantage, and then these two screens show you the applications from Spark. One is the Spark, the Spark classification, and the other one is the processing itself. And this is continuously running on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. OK. OK, so future work with this. Um, the ARIMA algorithm here um, to be honest, it doesn't predict as well as I would have hoped. It, uh, not exactly, but it sort of mimics the, val the latest values, um, and it needs to be improved, and this is what basically prevents me from uh, being rich. Um, the other... The other thing is that because of the limitations of the source, um, I can only get up to 200, maybe 300 equity values, okay? So that's not much. I, I want much more data. And, uh, because of the, and for that, I need to have different data sources associated to the, to the architecture, sending it to Kafka, to different topics. So that is another thing that I need to take care of. Uh, and then basically just update the code a little more. Basically, basically change from version 2.2, 2.4 of the, or 2.5 now, actually. Uh, Ignite, there's no security nor monetization right now. Uh, there's a lot to, to be done. Um, however, that's it for today.